Ah, bonjour. Je m'appelle Chris Johnson from the Normies, and I would like for you to give it up to our final keynote speaker, who's going to be talking with us about how small design studios can provide solutions for big challenges. Straight out of Toronto, Canada, it's going to be Jay Wall and Kayla Jacques of Rally Rally. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much. It's, uh, it's great to be in beautiful Indy today, uh, at least virtually, <laughs> coming to you from, from Toronto. Um, we're here in pandemic lockdown mode, uh, holed up in our respective homes. Um, so nice to, nice to have some time at the end of the week. Um, thanks so much for, for creating space for us. It's been you know, great to watch some of the talks this week and um, be part of the many conversations. Um, so just a little bit, uh, we're gonna kind of share a bit of our story today. Um, you know, Rally Rally is a design studio dedicated to social change. We'll get more into that, but we wanna kind of start with how we got here and then also take you through a bit of the journey of some of the projects that we've worked on over the years um, that have helped uh, define and shape the way that we see ourselves as designers and our role in advancing social change. Um, so just a little bit about where we're coming to you from, from Toronto. Um, this is actually Treaty 13 territory, um, subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, um, which is an agreement to, for everyone who lives around here to, to take care of the Great Lakes and the resources um, around here. Um, we do that as, uh, as settlers in this place, and we try to be mindful of that uh, in the approach to our work. And we think especially given the, the, the topic this week of sustainability, we're going to be talking about, uh, we're going to be kind of detouring a little bit from, from, from sustainability topics uh, to talking a bit more broadly about design and social change across a range of issues, including environmental issues, um, but others as well. So we're taking kind of a holistic view there. So let me take you back about a decade. Let me introduce you to this guy. This is me um, with, uh, with longer hair and uh, a different period of my life. This is actually a picture from my graduating design class, um, which Kayla was actually a part of um, at York mm -hmm. University and Sheridan College here in Toronto. And uh, you know, at that, that moment um, I had heard of, there was these conversations I think maybe weren't quite as mature as, as, they, were, as they are nowadays. Um, this talk about, you know, what is our role as designers to, uh, you know, to do social good or social impact, whatever those words might be. And I'd heard about the First Things First manifesto from back in the 1960s talking about, you know, designers who were sort of saying we should use our, uh, especially as like branding and graphic design folks, using our, our, our expertise to do more than to sell stuff. I was like, that really resonated with me. I was starting to get a bit more politically engaged and curious about the world, but still very naive. So I was kind of asking this question, like, can design save the world? I don't know. I want to explore that and see what that's like. So around the time that my school was wrapping up, um, something in Toronto happened called the G20 Summit. Uh, this is in the summer of 2010. Um, this photo uh, by coincidence is actually about 100 yards down the street from where our studio is right now in downtown Toronto. Um, and that weekend, there's a big G20 Summit and uh, mass militarization of the police and mass protests. Um, and I ended up, uh, I would not say I was an activist at that time, but I ended up kind of experiencing some things that weekend and ended up getting unlawfully arrested disappeared off the street for 28 hours, locked up in a cage. Uh, eventually my, my bogus charges were dropped. Um, I got this souvenir, this pink bracelet uh, with, a, with a prisoner number on it. Um, but more than that, uh, I came out of this with a, a kind of a, a greater awareness of my own privilege. Um, I was pissed off. I was, this talk of, you know, before we're talking about social justice in more abstract sense, I had, you know, coming aware of my privileges, uh, especially as a white guy, um, and thinking about interactions with the police. Um, this was really eye-opening for me to go through this experience than to be processing the trauma. And it really motivated me to dig into the world of social justice activism uh, and to use kind of answering that question or trying to answer that question from before of can design save the world or what is the role of a designer? So um, in those uh, early days, I, I started my own design practice um, before it became Rally Rally. It was sort of my own, my own thing about 10 years ago. Um, got very involved in like environmental justice, social justice movements um, here in Canada and in Central America. Um, that's me dressed as an owl, giving a hoot at a climate march. And uh, beyond that, it was, you know, as I started my studio, I was doing a lot of like, just like scrappy, small activist work for, um, for indigenous solidarity movements, um, for uh, climate action projects. I actually had a project featured in Adbusters in 2013. That was pretty cool. Um, 
And I would say like, I was just trying to like develop a, an understanding of how to merge design with the social justice world, um, but still in the sort of this very like figure it out as you go kind of way. Cause I had basically no experience working in design agency other than like a six month gig. Um, so that's kind of, um, those were the first few years of my journey. Hi everyone, again, just to echo what Jay said, thanks so much for having us. Um, I'm gonna tell you a bit how I arrived at Rally Rally. So as Jay mentioned, we did our undergrad together. And then right after the undergrad program, I decided to do my master's at York University as well. And this really was because I wanted to explore a topic that interested me very much so a bit deeper. And really when I stepped into my career, I wanted to show a portfolio of work that really um, spoke to what you know, my values were and what was at my core and present that type of work um, in the industry. So I wanted to focus my brother, I should mention, my brother has, uh, his name is Michael, and he has autism and an intellectual disability. And I've always been interested in, you know, how he sees the world and how he learns. And I always felt that there was ways that design uh, and visuals could really help him to, you know, be the best version of himself and to learn concepts that might, uh, that he struggles with. So what I focused on for my thesis was really looking at individuals with Asperger's, which were kind of um, outside of autism back then, but now it's kind of seen as one spectrum of all inclusive to autism. Uh, and I was looking at time related, uh, time related struggles and challenges for adults with Asperger's. So um, my brother really struggles with uh, the sense of time and the feeling of time. So at work, if there's a 15 minute break, he doesn't necessarily know what that feels like. So he has to set a timer. Um, and I remember as a kid, we used to always say to him, you know, it feels like one episode of something like Saved by the Bell or of something, some TV show. So he could have a sense of what that felt like. So I dove into this. I spent two years doing my master's and I really felt that I developed a strong sense of being able to tell a story through research and design, as well as um, come up with an app in the end. They, they kind of assisted um, it was a participatory approach. So I had four different participants involved in the process. Uh, so it was a, a great learning experience for me. And then, oh, at the same time, I worked at um, Evergreen Brickworks as a freelance designer. Um, and this is a, a really uh, great industrial building that is in kind of located in the Toronto Ravine system. And it was an old industrial brickworks factory and now is seen as a green design building that really cares about creating cities that are livable, green space and prosperous. So uh, this site is open to the public and there's lots of different things you can do here. Uh, what I helped with was a lot of marketing communication pieces as well as some installations. So this gave me a little bit of a skills about um, being able to see my design in kind of public spaces. From there, right after my master's at York, I went to Bruce Mao Design, which is a design studio here in Toronto. Um, and I looked, uh, I spent four years there and I worked with some great people. And this was really, um, a, I started as a junior designer here. So I was thrown into some really great projects, got to learn what I was really interested in. I focused a lot of, in education, um, health and uh, culture projects and a lot of book design, print design. I was able to work on a website, which helped me develop skills in that, uh, meet some really talented people across the globe um, and really develop my design skills and the design process. And then kind of just as a, a side gig, I've been able to use um, my brother's relationship and mine to be able to help support him to develop and publish two amazing books, which are on the side here. Um, can't Read, Can't Write, Here's My Book, which was his first book in 2018, and then a children's book to follow um, just last year. And this relation, I've been able to use design really just to, to support him in achieving the goals that he wants to do, amplifying, amplifying his voice, um, and giving him a platform to really get to know him and to make positive change in the communities. So, you know, he's done over 250 presentations. He's sold 20,000 copies of his first book. Um, and he's really, really um, shifting the dialogue around what it means to have autism. And so I'm gonna pass it to Jay to talk a bit about Rally Rally. And I should say what led me to Rally Rally was really 
um, knowing what the, the studio was about and how it aligned with uh, the types of things I wanted to learn more about and use design to amplify the great work of our clients. Thanks, Kayla. So, you know, while, while I was uh, figuring out my way as a design activist uh, and trying to figure out how to make ends meet doing that, uh, Kayla was off getting some great experience uh, doing research and then working at Bruce Mao Design. Um, and so then about five years ago, we, 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 we reconnected and uh, started working together um, under the banner that eventually became known as Rally Rally. So um, we describe our work as designed for social change. We work with change makers for a more just society. Um, we do this in lots of different ways. Um, work with nonprofits, with governments, with uh, purpose-driven businesses and foundations. Um, this is a list of some of the, the types of uh, organizations that we worked with, ranging from urban planning to climate action to health and human rights and um, everything in between. Um, in terms of the type of work we do, it's uh, and these are, again, some of the organizations that we worked with, ranging from uh, city governments like City of Toronto to uh, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and some health equity projects uh, in the States, um, as well as uh, international organizations like UNICEF and some other smaller nonprofits that uh, you might not recognize in, in Indiana. Um, a lot of our work falls under the umbrella of branding, communications design, web design, campaigns, and, um, but we're pretty multidisciplinary as a studio. Let's go ahead, Kayla. Um, before we dive into some of our client work, I just want to show you some of the things that we do as a team to go beyond uh, beyond our day-to-day -day as graphic designers and kind of expand the types of things that we do. Um, so we've been working on some street art projects over the years, uh, doing some public space activations, whether that's painting murals in bike lanes or traffic light box signals at intersections. Um, and it's always like an interesting way to get off our computers, reconnect with the team, obviously in non-COVID times when it's safe to do that um, and to kind of meet people on the street and you know, have face-to-face -face engagement with, with folks who are engaging with our art. In addition to that, we sometimes do some pro bono projects. So this is an example of a campaign where we teamed up with an indigenous artist named uh, Isaac Murdoch um, to create this campaign called One, uh, One Land, One People essentially is an indigenous solidarity movement um, in support of, uh, it really came out of when there was a large uh, uh, so-called migrant caravan um, approaching the like, US-Mexico border um, a, a few years ago. Um, and it was sort of a, a statement um, done in solidarity with other indigenous artists um, around the world. Um, we created, we worked with Isaac um, to create some visuals for, for that, that kind of went, uh, went all over the place um, as, a, as a sign of support. All right, so we're gonna uh, go through a handful of little case studies to give you, uh, give you a taste of, uh, of what we're thinking about. Um, and just uh, before I pass it to Kayla, you know, really the point we're trying to drive home here today is like, what is our role of designers? And we really wanna highlight the important work that our clients, that our project partners are doing and how what we do can help amplify their messages, help them to tell their stories, um, help them to build awareness um, and ultimately to have a greater impact. So Kayla, over to you for this uh, Center for so Social Innovation case study. Great. So this project with Center for Social Innovation for Climate Solutions. So we worked with um, the Center for Social Innovation, which is a social enterprise based in Toronto who works across sectors to create a better world. So it's very broad, but they work in, they provide co-working spaces and community of people who are working in this space to make um, better impact in the world. Climate Ventures is the project that we took on and it's an initiative that's out of CSI. Um, and it's really an incubator for entrepreneurs and leaders that are working on creating climate solutions and climate justice. And we created, um, we did a brand as well as a website and some communication material pieces for them. Um, it's called Climate Ventures, this logo that we created for them we wanted to use a circle around the text and then kind of show energy to it and show transformation and change um, in a way that is exciting, um, creating movement. It's kind of a hub. And this is really what this, this initiative was all about, people coming together to create that change. So uh, with this brand, we created a website and you'll see kind of the, the circle and it had four different states of transformation. It's kind of um, used throughout the website. We use green as related to the climate, which makes sense as kind of our, our call to action that's spread out throughout the website. Great images of people doing work. Um, 
They really focus on three main sections. So co-working space, community and programs. And this is shown on their website as long, alongside uh, talking about their vision and news and events and things that are happening. This is a site that we knew uh, needed to be credible and give these people a really good space to go to, to show the work they're doing and to collaborate and get to know other people. Um, and we knew that it would evolve and that was kind of a tricky task to, to work around, but to provide them with other colors that they could use for different programs, flagship programs. This is an earth tech one uh, that we could give the space to as the program got more funding uh, to do this, this type of work. Um, and a really important part of this was to showcase the people doing the work and give uh, these great photos and the different work they're doing a place or a stage to, to show that. Uh, and this could be anything from fashion to transportation. These are all people that are really passionate about um, the climate and making it better. Another thing I should say is the website has a filtering option for the community that allows people to kind of sort uh, who might align with uh, the sustainable development goals or the type of work that they're doing or the type of people. So it had a lot of different filtering options. And we were able, this was actually a space that we used to work in. So we were able to go back to the space, which is a couple doors down from our current building um, and look at the space and kind of add some of our, our graphics to the space to really uniform and unite the brand. So what this has really done is they've been able to attract members, funders, get media attention, and it really gave them a good platform for the awesome work they're doing. Um, they, the members have raised $33 million um, just in the last two years. So we know that this isn't all attributed to the brand, but it, it is helpful to see um, how a brand and a story and the hard work that our clients are doing around such an important issue, climate change, uh, can kind of all package into one. Right on. So our next project is actually one of the members of Climate Ventures, hmm. uh, Bitech Environmental Technologies. Um, so this is a project we did with Phytech for clean energy. Now, um, Phytech works in biogas. Essentially what biogas is, is it means like taking uh, organic waste and converting it into renewable energy. Um, so imagine like that apple core um, or, um, uh, I mean, even like wastewater. Those are things that can be, can, can be transformed into energy. So um, Phytech came to us uh, about a year ago they had been established as a company in Germany um, with, a, with a more German sounding name, Finsterwalder Umfeldtechnik, and they were preparing to open up a North American uh, branch of the company uh, called Phytech. Um, now, essentially, this is a, the biogas space is really dominated by a lot of like really engineering oriented language and visuals, lots of blues and greens. And so we were looking for an opportunity with Phytech uh, to stand out and set them apart. Thankfully, they have something that I can actually stand behind in terms of that because Phytech has a really um, really design driven approach to uh, the biogas plants that they build and the biogas products that they supply. They kind of see, see themselves as the apple of biogas, even though they're much, much smaller, they're basically a startup, um, but we wanted to help them establish credibility and uh, expand into the North American market. So in terms of visual identity, um, we looked to the original uh, German logo and simplified it. We took some elements, there were some red arches based on the original logo. Um, we pulled them out and made this, um, this more simple, bold mark um, that they could really uh, stand behind. Based on that, we developed this whole marketing toolkit. Um, and part of it was like not just the look and feel, but also how do we tell this story about biogas in a way that doesn't just speak to the biogas geeks, but is also going to be of interest to um, government procurement people who are looking at municipal waste systems um, or to uh, other potential partners who maybe know a little bit about biogas partner experts. So we developed some language with them, like waste has never been this clean. We took those arches and we did some, a lot of original photogra uh, photography and video and integrated those arches as a graphic device through the system. So you'll see here through some of the samples of the website um, where we've, uh, again, all original photography we worked with, uh, we went to four different sites across Canada, uh, getting shots of, of their biogas plants in action um, testimonials from their very happy clients, and then paired that with some engineering oriented content, a bit more of like, okay, so like not just what are you doing, but how does it work? Trying to explain some of these products. And we developed a you know, typeface system that, that balances this like more marketing voice with this more a technical specification engineering vibe um, with these really strong navy, navy blues and reds. 
Um, and then again, here's some examples of how that works on the website. Um, so we've currently been helping them to roll this out, across the, roll out the branding across all their materials, uh, everything from their trucks to their, their apparel. And in uh, addition to that, we, we made this like epic two minute brand anthem video to help tell their story. Um, and uh, it's, you know, if you go to phytech.ca later, you'll get to see some of that. And so here's just some, some stills um, from that video. And one of the cool things about phytech is um, recently, you know, we launched this website and they shared it with their German counterparts. And the, Ger the German team said, oh my gosh, phytech, you look like a very big and established <laughs> company and you're actually only a couple of people. And we're like, yeah, exactly. That's kind of what we're going for. So this is an example where um, they're, they're a really uh, amazing company um, helping to drive forward biogas solutions, which is like a really important aspect of, of climate action. And uh, we've, we're helping them to reach new audiences and to expand their business by helping them to tell their story uh, more clearly. Great. So the next project we're gonna talk about is with UNICEF for rights of women and girls. So this was actually one of the first projects that I worked on when I joined Rally Rally. It was a very large, large project um, and a very important project. Um, we worked with UNICEF to create a kit, a resource pack that would assist workers um, in dealing with gender-based violence in emergencies. So what that really means is in humanitarian emergencies such as um, refugee crises or camps, natural disasters and wars, where women and girls are very vulnerable, we wanted to make sure that people in the field helping were um, able to prevent and respond to these uh, very important uh, needs for children and women. So uh, when we were tasked or when we read the brief, uh, we were kind of surprised at how robust and dense this document was. It was uh, 2,600 pages of content that we needed to read through very important content, content that would be used by different audiences at different times. Um, so we needed to think of a way to make all this technical information not only accessible to country officers, but to people in the field working with the women and children. Uh, and how are we gonna do that? We didn't wanna have an encyclopedia of content that someone wouldn't be able to, to bring into the field. So how could we break up the content into these different typologies to um, make it useful. These were some prototypes that we developed to kind of see, you know, what's the right format for this? Is it a, a box that you open that has a different, uh, different booklets in it and different pieces that you can take out and bring with you as you need? Or is it a binder um, that has divisions in it and different page sizes so you can have easy access? But again, a series of binders. We kind of knew based on this amount of content that it was gonna have to be a series of something. So um, they actually, the client, we worked with someone in New York that was from the UNICEF team, a project manager that was also based in New York, and we were working with a writer in Australia. So this was a very collaborative project and we were doing it kind of in this, this similar way to COVID where it is remote. But uh, what we came up with was a series of kits uh, that would be housed together. And we came up with nine. So from getting started to the assessment to responding to kind of evaluation. And something that I want to speak to is the design for this. So we were really inspired by the photography that we were working with, the places, the textures, the colors that we saw. And we wanted to create something that evoked um, kind of a feeling of hope and optimism and was positive. So there's a little glitch here, but I'll go to this page. And mixed with the idea of uh, being able to showcase photography, we used color, icons, numbering to really sort out the content and make it easy to kind of navigate through. This is an example of what one kit would kind of contain, a card, a case study booklet, a assessment booklet, some tools, learning modules. There was kind of an overview story. And then this is what some of the spreads would look like. So, you know, still making it designed and like someone would want to read this and pick it up and go through the content and kind of guiding them through the process. So you can see the icons are used throughout the text to then get them to pick up the case study book. So this is a preview of what you would see the full case study in its own booklet. There was additional resources that people could um, draw their attention to. And this really was um, made for people that had extensive knowledge in gender-based violence. 
um, education and then people that were just coming to it new and needed to be able to have those extended resources available to them. There was a series of worksheets where people could do the assessments in the field to see uh, what was needed, what do we need to do immediately. And again, working with this kind of abstract visual and color coding to really uh, make this resource kit optimistic and get people excited about doing this work when it is a very uh, sensitive topic. Uh, this is for learning modules. So this is for people that would use this more in the country offices where they're educating people and running a class on what it is you're to do. And this is just a photograph of everything together. So this was a really fun project. It was a long project, but it definitely was a very important one. It's needed. Um, oh, and we were excited to be a part of it. Thanks, Kayla. Coming back a little closer to home now, uh, we want to show you a project in the city of Windsor, Ontario. This is a project with Transit Windsor for integrated mobility. So um, if you can picture uh, Detroit, Michigan, and Windsor, Ontario, one of the one of the interesting places at the north at the US Canada border where Canada is actually to the south. Um, so this is just across the river from Detroit. We're in the city of, of Windsor. It's a mid-sized city, about 200,000 people. Um, we were working with the tr public transit agency, Transit Windsor, as well as a, a transit consulting firm, uh, Dillon Consulting, um, to so come up with a new transit master plan. So uh, let's go to the next slide. We have uh, this city, uh, their transit system is a bunch of buses. Um, the transit system itself uh, hasn't really been updated in about 40 years in terms of the route maps of like where the buses go and what the schedules are. But the city is like quickly changing and evolving. You have a rapidly diversifying population. You have a lot of low income and uh, international students that rely on the bus um, as well as newcomers. It, but it's still a really car oriented city. Um, and so the transit agency was looking at how can we um, improve our system and rethink it in order to meet the challenges of the future look to environmental sustainability, but also to social equity. And then how do we make sure that in that process, it's not just about a bunch of transit planners in a room looking at data, but also getting out there on the streets and on the buses and talking to people in the community about how transit could better serve their needs, whether they're current riders or whether they've never taken the bus and have thought about it. So uh, we came up with this campaign um, called More Than Transit. And we had these, uh, we put out these uh, ads around the city, whether it was on bus shelters or social media, well, with words like shape transit, shape our city. Um, and if you kind of look at the visual DNA of this project, this is the uh, Transit Windsor's logo. We did not design this. This is uh, several decades old. Um, and they weren't at this point yet looking to like redesign their identity, but we're like, okay, what can we pull from that identity that can be a, a launch pad for our own design system for this campaign? So we pulled out the, uh, let's go back a sec. We pulled out the the arrow, the circle, the parallelogram, the blue, green, yellow. And they were like, okay, let's make some interesting shapes out of these, some interesting compositions. And we can actually talk about the idea of shaping transit, shaping our city, and then that being paired with language, but this is more than transit. So riding the bus isn't just about getting from point A to point B. We're actually talking about like, um, how can transit better connect you to school, to work, to shopping, to the hospital, uh, et cetera. And so this campaign really encouraged a lot of people to take part. Uh, whether it was in print, on the bus, or in social media. Um, and it really made a big splash. Oops. Um, it's fine. Keep going. So we also have this animated uh, video. Um, you're not going to hear the sound here, but um, basically we looked at how do we take the elements of that poster and animate them. So we had a bit of an animated um, poster um, shared on social media. Um, there's a really cool music track with this that you can't appreciate right now. But we have this like modular, uh, modular type that kind of like changes uh, changes uh, dynamically. This is another example of the ads uh, on the bus. And ultimately it was driving people to take part in filling out a survey online or going onto a map and marking up their feedback or going to a public meeting. And let's go ahead. So the results of this, um, city council uh, and the city staff said basically this had, a, this was an unprecedented turnout in terms of uh, online and in-person uh, participation in Windsor. Um, so we had uh, over 2,000 responses, which is about more than 1% of the city population filling out the survey, 700 phone surveys, and then um, uh, several other workshops with stakeholders and staff. And ultimately the result of this was 
um, a new transit plan that kind of lays out the future decades of transit Windsor's uh, strategies and policies and action and investment in terms of they're actually redesigning where the buses go in the city. They're looking at um, uh, different ways of connecting with technology um, and how to, how to improve ridership, marketing and awareness and all of that. And we also kind of packaged it up with a bit of a brand strategy. We didn't rebrand them, but we said, here are the steps you need to take to make sure that your brand and marketing improve alongside your actual service experience. So our next project is with the City of Toronto for housing affordability. Um, so like many uh, cities, it's becoming less and less affordable to live in the city and to buy housing. So what the City of Toronto wanted to do was create a campaign uh, that would get com community engagement as well as educate people around one policy solution that can be used to create more affordable housing. Um, we worked with a consulting agency that really ran the engagement process, but we were tasked with how do we, one, speak to people living in Toronto and connect to them, and how do we create something that's gonna get their attention as well, get them involved to drafting this policy, and what does that really mean? So I'm gonna play this little GIF if it works. It's only 2% of housing built or approved in Toronto in the last five years has been affordable, so that's just a stat. And we knew this was a really important campaign to do and raise public awareness, just to speak about kind of the, the design for this. We wanted to create a house, but more to represent a home. So, you know, it is the, the icon of a house, but it kind of transforms its height. So it could represent, you know, single home, a condo, a mid-rise building in the city, uh, and it could feel relatable to many. And then the idea of a gradient of colors and this overlapping that happens is the solution, which is to create more mixed income housing, which is people, any, uh, many people, we created messaging around, you know, who is everyone that we want to be able to afford housing in Toronto? It's all these people from accountants, dog walkers, to flight attendants, to musicians, to zookeepers, et cetera. Everyone should be able to afford housing in Toronto. Um, we created some materials for engagement process. And what this really means is it was about getting uh, housing activists and developers to kind of get on the same page when it comes to a city and the importance of mixed income housing where, you know, if someone were to develop a home, uh, a condo building, a certain percentage of those units have to be affordable to people. So what does affordable mean? There's lots of things that are defined in this policy. Uh, and that's something that the city was looking to the community to help shape. And you can see there was workshops to get uh, people thinking about this. So again, to really create a, a complicated subject matter, this was something that I had to learn more about and making it accessible and that people could have this, com uh, this conversation and make change in policy and help shape it. So we use these graphics in this color system to kind of play with infographics and create um, data for people. And really this, this policy is still being drafted. But as I mentioned before, it was seen as a way for a bit of a common ground between housing activists and uh, developers in the city to see that the importance of this and how we need to move in this direction. So. Uh, that was a fun campaign that we got to do with the city of Toronto. Okay, this is a uh, one more project to show you and then we're going to wrap up. So this last one is with artery for equality and civil rights. So artery is uh, a, a startup with a large presence in Toronto and New York, as well as other cities um, that believes every space is a stage. So basically they serve to they connect creators and artists uh, with people who have a space to offer. So for example, they have concerts in people's backyards. Uh, I've heard of operas in bathrooms where like five people buy a ticket and crowd into a bathroom and the singer standing in the, in the tub. Um, you have had, you, know, you might have an art show in a, in a barber shop or a laundromat. Um, so they do these really interesting uh, pairings of, uh, and it's a community-based platform where you can offer your space or if you're looking for a space to show your work, you can come together and make that happen. Now, um, back when the previous uh, president was elected um, and there were very quickly some, some harmful uh, policies that were particularly xenophobic and racist put into place, 
the artery community wanted to come together and show a strong response to that. So they're asking, how can we support um, the cause for racial justice and inclusion in America uh, while also helping to build community and, and, and strengthen those ties within the artery community? So they came up with something called 14A. 14A is actually a short form for the 14th Amendment, which basically asserts uh, each individual's rights um, and to be treated equally under the law. And so we helped the Artery team to build awareness of this campaign uh, and a bit of a movement by, by creating a visual identity uh, for this. So 14A, so we took the, the letter 14A, we put them on uh, a stage, which is also a reference to the stripes of the, of the American flag, which is also an equal sign. So really reinforcing that idea of equality. And that, so they're saying it was pop-up performances in support uh, of civil liberties and human rights. Now, this is just a little like sketch of how it works. So you have that 14A equal sign, it opens up kind of like a stage and it can become a place where you put in uh, powerful statements and images. So um, this is an example of how it could work. So this system we carried through uh, lots of different promotional materials to advertise, to help organizers advertise their own shows. Now we heard from the artery community that not everyone wanted to lean into like a ultra patriotic uh, blue and red palette. We actually created a palette that was a bit of like a teal blue and a bit of a coral red kind of referencing the colors of the women's march. But then we created an alternate palette. So if you weren't comfortable with those colors that didn't speak to you, you could choose from something else like green or black or violet. Um, and then you could populate these poster templates or these social media templates with information about your own showcase um, to get the word out, but then also to report back and share highlights from like, you know, Instagram shot of what happened last night in my apartment. Um, and so this helped to the, the community to, uh, to get the word out and to like be, be very clear in asserting what they stand for. We even came up with this idea of like these cards that could be printed out and like put out on the table at the showcase where you could fill in that blank space, fill in that stage yourself with a marker. Like what does 14A mean to you? So there we go. Um, just on some closing thoughts as we bring it all together. Now that we've showed you actually six of our projects spanning many different communities and countries, um, everything from like branding to, to web design to these like physical kits that are out um, in, in, in humanitarian zones across the world. Ultimately a point here is like, good visual communication can cut through the noise and make complex topics approachable. Um, so, you know, we really see design not just being about like prettying things, prettying things up, but actually, okay, so the clients that we work with, they're doing really important work. Um, we like to help them amplify their message to bring more people into their movements, uh, to help them raise funds, to build awareness. Ultimately, that is to reinforce what they're doing. So we're not the heroes. Um, we just know that we have a role to play in humbly supporting and amplifying what they're doing, which is why we like to say, you know, we can rally together to go further and make a greater impact. When we bring their subject matter expertise and their passion with our design expertise and our passion, we're really proud of what we do. So going back to the original question that the naive Jay asked himself a decade ago um, back in design school, can design save the world? The, the answer we've arrived at is no, design won't save the world, but it can make a difference. And that's why Rally Rally is here to stay. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank we're you. happy to go into to Q and A for whatever time we have left here. Guys, thank you so much. Um, I wanna be very, very uh, cognizant of your time. Um, but I definitely want to thank you for being here um, to both you, Jay, and Kayla, and again to Jay, who has a newborn at home, <laughs> for, for making this time to uh, come and, and be in our little little city um, and, and really show us the fantastic work that you guys have been doing. Um, I liked the, 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 just the level of your work and how great it is, uh, the quick distancing uh, from the, the Transit Windsor logo, that was definitely not your logo, <laughs> but you were still able to take bits and pieces of it and, and create something remarkable and it was able to bring uh, a bunch of support and um, questions and, and bringing the community together to build something that was, that was that's better for the transit system, which every, every major city needs in me. You know, just saying. <laughs> um, 
So, so I do want to be aware of your time. So I'm, I'm really just kind of going to ask one question and then a silly question. Um, what kind, is there uh, like a balance that you've had been finding um, keeping Rally alive? So like having a constant flow of projects and then choosing the projects that you want to really that really kind of like keep your mission alive. Um, has there been like a difficulty even at first uh, finding that balance? Yeah. Thank you for thank you for your your positive support and and for the question. You know, thinking back to the early days, um, I think it was really a challenge to like find projects that would that could make it financially sustainable to run this kind of a business. You know, before we really had much like recognition or even much of a portfolio to stand behind us, it was like that's why it was so much just like scrappy like free work for activist organizations or activist groups that weren't even formal organizations. Um, but over time, as we built that expertise, we were able to kind of attract larger and larger organizations like the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation or these municipal governments that we were talking about, or UNICEF. Um, and I think in being so clear in like what we stand for and the kinds of work that we do, it actually makes our job easier that like pretty much everyone who reaches out to us has already self-selected and saying like, hey, are my values aligned with Rally Rally? I'd want to work with Rally Rally. And then we can just get more quickly to like, okay, like what is the project and is the budget and timeline? A good fit for what we're what we're going to do. Um, the actual like pretty much everyone who reaches out to us, we're super stoked about the type the types of things that they're doing in the world, and like that's kind of energy that we want to be a part of. Um, one other note related to that is, um, I think it's important or it's useful as a studio like this to not just work with nonprofits. Um, certainly, mm -hmm. a nonprofit organization is one type of organization moving the needle forward forward on issues, but mm -hmm. certainly you know governments. Um, and uh, purpose-driven businesses. We talked about like Fitech, that biogas company, um, you know, mm -hmm. who are basically still using the model of capitalism, um, but um, but trying to use it for good. Um, and we found actually having that diverse set of clients and partners has helped us to weather the storm of COVID. And so, you know, while some sectors are kind of being really affected, like we have some design colleagues in Toronto who did a lot of like work for restaurants and breweries and like, they had they had a period last year where they like everything fell out from under them. We never really had that because we were working with governments and they, those projects had kind of pivoted to respond to COVID. Or we were working in like the clean tech sector, which is like booming despite all the other challenges. So that's, right. that's where we're at. Excellent. Uh, I know I, we only have a minute, and uh, just real quick, um, do you want to start an arm of rally rally here in the Because that would be good. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm sorry if like, I phrased the question in a way that made you feel like you had to say yes. Um, I was kind of hoping for that. <laughs> um, um, no, I mean, we actually, we've actually been doing more and more work uh, in the States. Um, like currently we have some, pro uh, just wrapping up a project in uh, North Carolina and Mecklenburg County with their Parks and Rec Department. Um, as well as working in Maryland with the Maryland National Capital Parks and Planning Commission. Um, and so looking for like more and more opportunities in the States. And I think with that comes, you know, we're also happy to be building more of these connections and friendships with our, with our American pals um, to actually like work with us as well. Um, and I know that one of our, another member of our team, Rodrigo Calderon is actually uh, uh, watching in today too. And, you know, he, you know, um, it's kind of home base has been San Diego and has lots of uh, connections. So I think, you know, Rodrigo is also keen to help us um, extend our, our arm into, into the States and, and, and get some high fives and, and build some things together. Um, Kayla, before we wrap, can you just go to the last slide so everyone oh, yeah. can see our contact? There. Thank you. So yeah, this is a place where you're welcome to, to reach out, um, rallyrally.design or at rallyrally4, at, that's F-O-R on all the social handles. Um, or, or email me and can be in touch. Um, and so, if you have any final, <laughs> if you have any final questions that have like come through the chat, um, feel free to ask and maybe Kayla can take a, a take a quick pass before we, we shut this down. Oh, Thank you, Dick, for uh, doing that quick flip over there. Um, as far as uh, other final questions, um, I think on like, I'm seeing a lot of uh, bravos in the in the chat and um, the, the other questions I think uh, were about finding work. Um, it seems like you've hit a, a stride at a point where the work is finding you, which is which is like the idea of self-sustaining, right? And that's like 
a, a design agency's dream. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, we'll be able to put um, your contact info into the chat box. Uh, we had it up for a little while on screen and then we came back uh, over here. I'm watching both. <laughs> There's like a little bit of a delay that I'm having to bump right through. Um, so yeah, I think we're, we're all good here. Um, and sorry, that was <laughs> Yeah, thank you um, but so much. Dude, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank, you. <laughs> thank you guys. Thanks for having us. You're welcome and thank you. We're sending all our love from Toronto.